Hi, I'm uh, Charlie Huang from the Johns Hopkins University School of Medicine and from the Frederick Health Hospital. Today, uh, we're going to be talking about a case of spontaneous coronary artery dissection, or SCAD, in a postpartum patient. The uh, patient is a 35-year-old woman, uh, one week postpartum, uh, who presented to our ER with a crescendo substernal chest pain that started uh, a few hours ago. She has no significant past medical history other than infertility treatment. Uh, she did not look well. Her uh, blood pressure was 90 over 65, her heart rate was 110, and her oxygen saturation was 95% on four liters. ECG showed sinus tachycardia with two millimeters of ST depressions uh, in leads V2 and V3. STAT echocardiogram showed an EF of 35% uh, with severe mid to distal anterior and apical hypokinesis. A rapid troponin uh, was uh, positive at 0 0.6 uh, nanograms per mil. Uh, the upper limit of normal at this facility is 0 0.3 uh, nanograms per mil. So she was referred for urgent coronary angiography and possible PCI. On a diagnostic angiogram, um, the RCA had a very anterior takeoff, uh, but has no disease. Looking at the left side now, we can clearly see a white line extending from the distal left main uh, into the LAD. This white line is the, uh, the section flap uh, that separates the true lumen from the false lumen. Now, most of the time, it is actually quite difficult to differentiate the true lumen from the false lumen. In this case, however, it seems pretty clear that the true lumen is inferior to the white line, and the false lumen is the uplifted section above the white line. Um, this is a fairly dramatic example of a type 1 uh, spontaneous coronary artery dissection that extends from the distal left main uh, into the uh, proximal LAD. Uh, fortunately, there was still TMA3 flow uh, down the LAD. Um, here is another view of the uh, spontaneous coronary artery dissection. Uh, in this view, you can see that while there is still good flow in the LAD itself, uh, flow in a very large arborizing diagonal branch uh, has been severely compromised uh, by the uh, dissection flap. Uh, the uh, circumflex uh, is affected as well. Uh, its ostium appears partially compromised uh, by the uh, dissection flap in the left main, and you can see that the uh, dissection spreads all the way down into uh, the small first OM branch as well. And in this view, you can also see that the dissection in the LED actually reaches up to the mid LED. But again, fortunately, uh, there is still TME3 flow in the circumflex. So, all right, imagine uh, if uh, this is your patient on the table, uh, what would you do next? So, uh, pregnancy-associated SCAD uh, constitutes about 5 to 17 percent of SCAD cases. It is rare, about 1.8 uh, per 100,000 pregnancies, and principally affects uh, multi paris women, uh, who have, uh, and many of whom who have undergone uh, inter infertility treatment. 70% uh, of the cases uh, do occur postpartum, and most commonly within the first week. And importantly, uh, for unclear reasons, uh, pregnancy-related SCAD uh, tend to have uh, more severe presentations like our patient, uh, including cardiogenic shock, uh, left main dissection, or uh, multivessel dissection. SCAD is often classified using the YIP-SAW uh, classification. Uh, type 1 uh, is the uh, classic version, uh, as we have in our patient, uh, with communication between the true and the false lumen and a double lumen the, and the section flap uh, clearly seen uh, on uh, angiography. Uh, type 2 uh, is essentially a long intramural hematoma with no communication between the false lumen uh, with the hematoma and the true lumen. So on angiography, uh, type 2 SCAD has the appearance of a sudden taper in the caliber of the blood vessel uh, with uh, distal uh, reconstitution of normal vessel. Uh, in these cases, there is no dissection flap uh, that is seen. Type 3 is essentially a short version of type 2 and is often angiographically indistinguishable uh, from just atherosclerotic plaque. Uh, 
How does a scat form? Well, uh, one common hypothesis uh, is the so-called uh, out, uh, outside-in hypothesis. Uh, the idea is that there is some injury or disruption of the microvessels within the wall of the blood vessel, uh, either in the adventitia or in the media, that then causes an intramural hematoma to form. If the intramural hematoma remains contained and does not extend along the length of the blood vessel, then you have the type 3 uh, SCAD. If the intramural hematoma starts uh, extending longitudinally, uh, then you progress to type 2 SCAD. Now, with both type 2 SCAD and type 3 SCAD, if rather than or in addition to extending longitudinally, the hematoma starts expanding uh, radially into the lumen of the vessel, uh, then vessel occlusion uh, can occur. Um, and in some cases, extension of the intramural hematoma can expand to the point of causing a tear uh, in the intima. This then results in uh, direct communication between the false lumen that had the hematoma and the true lumen, and that causes the formation of a dissection flap and progression to type 1 SCAD. Uh, in some cases, uh, a small focal intimal tear uh, can actually decompress the intramural hematoma and result in restored flow in the true lumen. Um, however, uh, the opposite can happen as well. Uh, flow from the true lumen can enter the false lumen via the intimal tear and cause the tear to enlarge and then further extend the false lumen and then rapidly uh, precipitate um, uh, an, uh, an occlusion. Uh, SCAD is thought to be triggered by a variety of things, including emotional stress, um, uh, vigorous exercise, uh, valsalva, uh, certain uh, hormones, as well as certain drugs. Uh, SCAD is thought to be associated with certain conditions as well, in particular uh, fibromuscular dysplasia or FMD, uh, certain uh, inflammatory disorders, um, uh, certain connective tissue disorders, as well as um, severe hypertension and uh, pregnancy. So uh, for the vast majority of your SCAD patients, uh, management is conservative. Uh, patients are generally hospitalized for a few days uh, for monitoring and uh, supportive care. Uh, now, the exception are the unstable patients. Um, if your patient has ongoing chest pain, uh, an ischemic ECG, or uh, is in cardiogenic shock, or has salvos of sustained VT or VF, or, or if the left main is involved, then a more aggressive therapy uh, should be considered. This includes PCI or cabbage, and a mechanical uh, circulatory support if needed. Uh, sometimes ECMO uh, or, or Impella uh, could be required. Uh, there was a recent uh, uh, small case series that was published in CCI in January of 2021 that demonstrated the feasibility of using Impella uh, to support some of the sickest uh, SCAD patients. PCI for SCAD is very challenging and should definitely come with a warning label. Uh, that's because there is a high rate of both early and late uh, complications. Um, during PCI, angioplasty and stenting uh, can cause a longitudinal extension of the hematoma and propagate uh, the dissection. In addition, uh, appropriately sizing the stent is challenging uh, because of the intramural hematoma and the distortion of the vessel architecture. So in many cases, stents that were initially well opposed can become malopposed later on uh, as the hematoma resorbs. So if you do find yourself uh, having to do PCI on an unstable SCAT patient, uh, be very careful. Uh, your first objective should be uh, to not uh, make the problem any worse. Uh, you don't want to cause a hematoma to propagate and worsen the dissection. So uh, pre-dilation and post-dilation should actually be minimized and if done, uh, should be kept at a relatively low pressure. Uh, consider fenestrating the dissection flap uh, before deploying a stent, and because that will help evacuate uh, some of the intramural hematoma and perhaps help restore uh, some semblance of uh, vessel architecture. Consider stenting directly and uh, using intravascular imaging to help size your stent. And choose longer stents uh, in many cases, far longer than you would typically choose, longer than the segment uh, with the intramural hematoma. The idea is that longer stents will help contain the hematoma. Uh, 
and some operators will even play short stents uh, separately in the normal segments proximal and distal to the hematoma uh, before they place in the main stent. And the, the idea is that the, the proximal and distal stents will help pin in the hematoma. And remember, your aim in these cases is not angiographic perfection. Uh, it is simply to restore flow in your otherwise unstable patient. Uh, perfect is the enemy of good, uh, especially in SCAD PCI. There is unfortunately not a lot of clinical evidence to help guide medical therapy in SCAD patients. Much of the evidence is anecdotal or based on expert consensus or limited studies. Uh, even anticoagulation is controversial, uh, given the potential risk of extending the intramural hematoma. So it is thought to be reasonable to actually discontinue heparin once SCAD is diagnosed, unless there is clear uh, intra uh, intraluminal thrombus. Uh, if your patient underwent PCR or cabbage, uh, the usual DAPT uh, guidelines would apply. Uh, if your patient did not get PCR or cabbage and was just managed conservatively, uh, aspirin uh, up to one year is felt to be reasonable. Uh, beta blockers are thought to be reasonable as well. Um, good blood pressure and heart rate control, uh, the idea is to reduce shear stress, are also thought to be helpful. The uh, benefit of P2Y12 inhibitors is unclear. Uh, some uh, have suggested a one-month course. And uh, the benefit of statins uh, is also unclear. Um, and really, they are only suggested for patients who have other reasons for statins, such as a pre-existing uh, dyslipidemia. Um, there is limited data on post-SCAD management as well. The uh, rate of recurrence uh, is thought to be anywhere from 10 to 30 percent, uh, but the factors associated with recurrence are, are unfortunately poorly understood. Uh, but it is thought that FMD, extreme exertion, or uh, emotional stress uh, could play a role uh, in uh, recurrence. So workup uh, should include assessing for extracoronary vascular abnormalities such as FMD or aneurysms uh, with imaging modalities such as CTA or MRA, uh, as well as obtaining a um, careful uh, family history. Um, recommendations for physical activity after SCAD uh, is also based on limited data. But in general, uh, it is thought that moderate exercise is likely to be overall beneficial. Uh, however, overdoing physical activities such as exercising to exhaustion, uh, extreme endurance training, elite sports, or, or extreme weight training, uh, these things uh, should be avoided. So um, how did our patient do? Well, uh, she uh, unfortunately developed progressive cardiogenic shock uh, even as her case uh, progressed. So a balloon pump was placed to support her. Um, this facility did not have access to Impella. Uh, she was urgently airlifted to a tertiary center where uh, she underwent cabbage uh, later that day. Uh, she ended up doing relatively well uh, and she was discharged home about a week later. A pre-discharge echo uh, that showed that her EF had uh, fully recovered. Thank you for watching.